Hello. All right. Last talk of the day. And most people have gone astray to uh, do something interesting, like maybe take a tour or learn about interesting things you can hack with Legos. So I appreciate you being here. Um, and uh, Dan did speak earlier about how I have the honor of being the person who came furthest, I guess, to speak at Over the Air. Um, it is a, a return trip for me, um, and I'm really glad to be back. So I have this talent, apparently. I've come 5,000 miles, 5,004 exactly. The airline tells you because they're like, you're going to get 5,004 miles. And I came 5,004 miles, and I got ridiculously sick. So um, I woke up at 2 this morning choking on my own phlegm. I've been up since. Um, I have a very sore throat, so there will be pregnant, dramatic pauses where I reach for some liquid to douse myself a bit. And if I actually make it through, say, 30 to 40 minutes of solid talking, I would consider that a great success uh, because it hurts. Um, this liquor is not working. So, funny, it worked at first. Um, so, it being this last talk of the day, I'm going to try something a little bit different than uh, what I uh, typically do. Um, I know that it's kind of a quiet time of the day, and I also respect that it's the end, and we're feeling pretty tired. I know I am with the whole being up since 2 a.m. thing. Um, so I'm going to do uh, something a little bit different. After the next few slides, you'll probably see very few words if I do it correctly. This is sort of a photo essay and a story. It's more of a narrative um, than a tech-heavy talk, uh, more but different than what I usually do. So I urge you. Um, I hope you can see the screen because it's all photographs, so if you can't see, you're not going to get that much out of it, um, and you know, make yourself comfortable. So I'm going to talk about how I think we need to do as little as possible to sort of save the web and build the future of the web from the perspective of being a mobile web developer, which is what I do day in and day out. And um, you know, it, it's been several years now since we sort of held hands and looked out at the horizon of the future, felt the sun on our faces and chanted together and believed that the mobile web was the future. And thus, together aligned, we went out nobly to, to set off and build that. We had various signs and glimmers that we could see that suggested that this was going to be our future. We had sort of maths and numbers and statistics that we could share embedded emails or put in presentations, send to each other, argue to each other and argue to the people around us that this mobile web thing was going to be upon us. And so indeed, it actually did come to pass. Um, as crap phone beget slightly less crap phone, as beget crap phone with something that sort of seemed like a browser, which begets something with something that was more like a browser, which you beget smartphones with sort of browsers, which beget smartphones with tolerable browsers, and eventually beget smartphones and other devices with browsers that were even pleasant uh, to use. And the data networks sort of chundled along behind that and tried to catch up. And the statistics about the use of the web bore this out. We saw the shift. We saw diversity and fragmentation, although fragmentation is a little bit of a negative word, but we'll, we'll just say that <laughs> Prost is definitely on that one, um, that we saw this start happening. We saw all sorts of different kinds of devices and new users join the web that we had already been together building for you know over a decade. And while we couldn't see everything in the future, not everything was illuminated to us, we had inklings and we had notions and some of those patterns that we began to see in our misty future and in our misty present even were that the, the, the web we've been designing, and for convenience, let's call it the desktop web for now, uh, that it wasn't, it wasn't quite cut out for what it needed to do with this mobile web reality being thrust upon it. It, it had some shortcomings. And in part, those shortcomings were because we had made some assumptions. And we imposed some assumptions on the desktop web as we built it. Assumptions about the size and shape, input and display types, and what people were up to when they were using the web. And those were starting to break down a bit as we moved into this mobile web future, or now present. And so some of the smart people among us got together, and we started hashing things out and making things work. But it was, it was, a, it was a big challenge in, in, in this brave new world that we had entered. So as we entered this new world of the mobile web, what kind of what did we experience? What did we see as we struck out into it, right? What were these patterns that we encountered? Well, at first, one thing was that we, we found a lot of space and emptiness. We were in a place where the rules and the laws and the maps and the paths had not been drawn out and defined for us yet. 
we had we had come to this place where we had to figure out how to make things work. We like to glibly compare ourselves sometimes to uh, cowboys on the Wild West. I mean, it's a little bit of a romantic notion, but we had we had come to the landscape where sort of a society of how the mobile web was going to work had not been yet defined, and we were charged and then responsible for figuring out independently and then in small bands like posses how to make it work. And if we thought we were coming out to the ranch to sort of relax and retire and stare at serenity, at serene views of the mountains and the landscape, that wasn't what we found, of course. What we found over and over and over and over was intense complexity and increasing complexity and multiplying complexity all around us. Whereas we may have wanted to find clarity and simplicity, we were, in fact, surrounded by constellations of complexity as new devices and new users joined the web. Globular clusters and galaxies around us in complexity, and we, it, we sort of swam through that and worked with each other to make something work. And we were able to cobble things together um, through sheer force of will, sometimes by the skin of our teeth, just barely that worked, but often we were fighting complexity with complexity, building solutions that were woven together um, of this complexity and often complex and perhaps fragile. And we found pretty quickly that we're reaching already our limits of the, the level of complexity with this device specificity that we could handle. It came upon us fairly quickly. So we're on this sort of ride going round and round, churning out what we can to, to, to make working websites that work on these early and then in slightly maturing mobile devices. And while this is all happening, we're very, very focused on what we're building, but yet I think we always knew as we were doing this that mobile, although important, is not the end of the road of the web. It's merely part of the long journey that is the road of the web. Um, you know, it, it would be foolish of us to think this is where it ends and this is where we get off of this ride. And again, we can't see the future entirely. It's, it's misty and occluded from us a bit. But we do know, or I think I know at least, that there's not, uh, there's not going to be a relief from the intense complexity that we're facing anytime soon in terms of the number of user agents and things on the web. And because of that, I feel that the way that we've been approaching building the web recently in the last years, as we've struggled to make things work at all, the device-specific hacks and the workarounds and the very specific ways that we're building websites are not scaling, are already breaking down, and can't scale into the future. And because of that, I would argue that we need to think about and try to do as little as possible as we plan the future of the web and try to figure out how to make it work. So I've talked about striking into this brave new world, but how, how did we get to sort of this, this crossroads, this fulcrum, this, I don't know, inflection point, as some people like to say, where the complexity just feels like it's pushing us over a cliff, where it just feels um, unimaginably complex in our world. And like I said, we were fighting um, to make things work with this twisting complexity underneath us, beyond our control, um, constantly evolving beneath us, uh, spiraling almost fractal. Um, and I think that as developers, a couple things were going on that influenced the way that we built the mobile web in its early and in early informative years. And there's two things that come to mind in terms of um, patterns that I think that we were following. One is that we were under typical commercial pressure, um, whether it's time or budget, to get things out the door, to get working websites and web apps out the door um, as much as we could. And we didn't have the luxury necessarily of time uh, to sit back academically and think about the patterns of the things that we were developing and whether we were doing them in a sustainable way. And I think that also we really, really cared about making things work. And so we dug deep and found some magic. We flung polyfills and workarounds and device-specific hacks. We dealt with device-specific problems with device-specific hacks because we had to to make things work in sort of a sorcerer's apprentice sort of way. And as these uh, user agents continue to multiply beneath us over and over again, new usage models and new humans getting on the web, it is an arbitrary side example, you know, tablets happened, right? And then it was like, okay, great, now we have to deal with this, right? And it's like, every um, as these devices and users hit the web, we're constantly branching and forking and branching and forking, and we've got this sort of ever-increasing complexity. And it's an arms race 
with which we're racing to keep up. So that's kind of putting it in a, a, a sort of like passive light. This is what happened to us. But at the same time, we were trying to make it better for ourselves. We were trying to impose some strategies on what we were building to make it slightly less insane, to tame the wildness of the path we were falling down into that early age of the mobile web. We had a couple strategies. For one, when faced with this stupid complexity of just device after device after device, we looked at that chaos, and instead of wallowing in it, in a lot of cases, we tried to find, um, identify patterns and uh, simplify things into uh, sort of more manageable things. We looked at commonalities between devices and users, and, and we try to encapsulate those perhaps into uh, manageable subsets. Instead of each individual device, maybe we're grouping devices together and finding ways that we can serve them. We reach for these patterns. We try to simplify our world a little bit, and we extrapolate on that, trying to find a little bit of simplicity. But at the same time that we were doing that, we were either purposely or inadvertently becoming deeply expert at what we were doing. Those of us out on the mobile web in the early informative years had to, by necessity, become very, very, very steeped in the details and ultra-specificness of developing for the mobile web. We became walking founts of knowledge and minutiae about these devices, about the device, device quirks and bugs, and we, we became this sort of rarefied breed that was very, very familiar with what we were building. In short, we became very immersed in the mobile mess of the web that we were constructing, very focused on the intricacies and device characteristics we were supporting. And because of that, the time was ripe for a shakeup. Because we hadn't stood back and looked at the greater picture of what we were doing, we were too focused and perhaps too um, mobile in, in what we were doing. And so it was Jeremy Keith, as I recall, who, who sort of threw the wrench in the works um, in, the, in the first place. He, he bluntly suggested a few years ago that maybe there is no mobile web. Maybe looking at the web and the mobile web as being something separate from the web was doing us more harm than good. And at the time, you know, it was a very, it was a very tricky pill to swallow because we'd become this specialized breed and we'd put so much effort in and we'd taken the beatings and it required us to step back and be like, what the hell? Like, man, what are you talking about? Like, how do we, uh, you know, it's, a, it, it's not just a pride thing, but a reality thing. Like, we're, we're over here doing this thing and working so hard, and now you're suggesting there's no mobile web. What does that mean? Let's think about that for a bit. It was sort of enervating and exhausting to think we put so much effort into building this thing and becoming very, very talented at building this thing, and maybe it's not a thing, and maybe we need to let go of that. You know, what does it mean to not have a mobile web? And if we're talking about maybe there isn't a separate mobile web that we're not off on, on this fork of the web building this other thing, but instead should be looking at the bigger picture, it leads to all these sort of around the campfire semantic arguments about what exactly the mobile web is and what makes something mobile, right? And there's like we're staring into the fire, arguing with each other, continuing to drink, recalibrating our understanding of what the, the mobile nets of the web is and what the web is in general. Um, you know, we're trying to work through these things. There's a very disconcerting notion. Because we were in this world of figuring out all these specifics, burying ourselves in the tasks at hand, and figuring it out, because it was damned hard. But there were signs. There were, there were things around us that suggested that, may, that we needed to bring the mobile web some of the things we've learned out there back into you know, the general web as a whole. We saw these signs, and there's like the double rainbow lovely thing of responsive web design, which at the time was fairly recent, which hinted at the notion that there were ideas that would come up with in the mobile space that had very good application in the general web, that maybe there, it, it isn't all about differentiation, but about creating a spectrum of experience across many kinds of devices and not just mobile ones. But it was an awkward balancing act because suggesting that we don't think of ourselves as mobile web developers off on this tangent, maybe that meant jettisoning all this kind of interesting special sauce that we had come up with that cherished what was special about mobile devices that, that, that actually had, had something going for it. And throwing all of that out seems sort of ridiculous, right? But we had put ourselves in the danger of creating some dead ends and locking ourselves out because we, we had wandered into this rarefied area of the mobile, mobile, mobile web 
And if we did want to think about bringing ourselves back into the sort of sheepfold of the general web, of the web overall, we are going to have to jettison a few of the device and mobile specific things we are doing in our processes to make this work. So for sake of argument, let's say welcome back to the, the World Wide Web. Let's, let's talk about the web holistically and not just mobile specific, but what does that mean and what are we looking at? So, okay, let's say we agree that the that mobileness is not the endpoint of the web, but but a waypoint. But let's not suggest that it's not important and recognize that there's this wonderful oeuvre of things that we've discovered about mobile devices that are that are um, wonderful and can nourish the future of the web and hold on to that carefully and start merging some of those really interesting ideas back into the future of the web as a whole. There's something that stands in our way here. I'm doing this. And that is that building a website these days is too damn hard. Um, to get a simple website to work on various devices around the world requires a huge amount of specialization and knowledge. And a couple of years ago, a bunch of us had gotten together to talk about ideas about the future of the pain device web. And it was right at that time that I was starting to feel somewhat confident in my ability to create a web, you know, a website or web app that did work fairly well on a lot of different kinds of devices. We got them together and we spent a weekend together and sort of written this manifesto, future friendly, um, put a name on it, and then we spent like a day or a day and a half building a website to host information about this manifesto. And we're not we're not talking about like a far flung multi armed sort of thing. There were three web pages coded in static HTML, two images, one style sheet. And a cache manifest, which does add complexity, but I'll, I'll leave that on this. And you know, we we were we worked really hard on this. There were like eight or ten of us working on this basic website. And it, it took us like all day, and we eventually like, deployed at like, two in the morning. And but we we're really, like, oh, I was feeling pretty smug about it. I was pretty happy with it. You know, I was like, that's cool. And then this smart guy over here, Scott Jensen, who's laughing at me. Um, you know, sat down with me at 2, 2.30 in the morning and said, I am, yeah, 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 your website's great, but why did it take you guys so long? And at the time, you know, I, I took it personally. Like, I, I felt really bad. I thought, ugh, as a dead, you know, like, I, I have to let him down. I, I haven't really done a good job. But what Scott was pointing out was that the amount of tedium and tasks required to get a damn website out the door, and I mean, a really simple website, had become smothering. And, like, how do regular people that don't have a team of 10 focused for a day and a half to build a basic website get their job done anymore? It's like, we come up to and we're falling off of a cliff of complexity that, that just, that it wasn't working. Like, it, it, and this continues to happen. This was two years ago, and things are not getting all that much better. It's like everything at that moment to me felt very hard and very sad. So, again, I hold out to you this idea of doing less of doing as little as possible to make the future of the web even possible. And really, when I talk about this, it, it, it can sound a little bit lazy. It can sound like I'm arguing that we should like kind of give up and wander away. But it's, it's not about that. Like I, I think that as web devs, we're pretty, we're, we're pretty committed to what we do, and we're not really lazy. It's also not a suggestion that we take everything that we have found to be special about mobile or other devices and like toss it out the window in a, in a fit of peak and walk away from it and go completely bland and give the same experience to everyone out there. But it is an argument to reach for, where we can, simplicity and or elegance. To, to really stress what the web is good at, which is commonality. It is, a, it is a place of sharing and approaching differentiation carefully. And underneath that, advocating for consistency in the, in the technologies that are there the creation and the application of web standards that drive the web. So people like lists and people like numbers and people like numbered lists. So here's a list of five things that I think that are thematically things that can move towards this less is more future. And I'll start with thing one, first thing, then thing, thing the first, which is this notion of integration that I've hinted at. The idea of taking the things that we've come up with out there in the wilds of the mobile web and pushing them back into the web as a whole, because the good news is there's a lot of great ideas, and it's not all for naught, right? 
we, I would think, I, I would suggest that it is not an overstatement to suggest that some of the ideas that we've come, that have come from the pioneering trends in mobile web design and development could, pa could be the nucleus of the future web. They're very important ideas, and I think a lot of them can transfer to a broader perspective. For one, the notion of designing and developing with constraints in mind. Some alternate ways of talking about this are um, mobile-first design, baseline-first design. The idea of embracing constraints and creating something that is common to your users um, it, as a baseline, as a core, and then enhancing out from that is a very important and wonderful idea, one that we can incorporate in the wider web, and one that we are. I don't, I don't want to say that you know, this, this is a really super new idea, uh, but it leads naturally to some of the tenets in responsive web design, where instead of imposing a one-size-fits-all rigid framework on all of our visitors and users, we're allowing the flexing and reflowing of things and, and, and different experiences based on the current state of the user's user agent. Um, you know, the, the notion of treating our content um, fluidly, letting it flow, not constraining it rigidly, but letting it express itself across um, different, different user agents. These ideas, which, which came to birth and came to fruition in the context of mobile and pan device web contexts, are absolutely something that can serve as core cogs and gears to the future of the web, and really, like I said before, are already serving its core cogs and gears to the web as we're moving forward. This is happening already, this integration. And as developers and designers who are in the know, who have that mobile experience and just have the general web experience, we can serve as leaders um, to help illuminate uh, these ideas and help teach the new generation of web devs and designers joining the web now. We can also look at the patterns we've built and understand how they can exist in context beyond mobile liberating our great ideas from the constraints specifically of mobileness and reaching and continuing to reach where we can for the simplicity and elegance and consistency of these ideas to bring the web together. So that's thing number one. In terms of simplicity and its sort of a polar opposite, the thing number two involves my urging you to assess and constantly reassess the difference when you're building and designing things between inspired details that make what you're building special and unique and quality versus soul and mind-crushing minutia that waste everyone's time and ruin your lives and kill your weekends and evenings. It's this morass we get into where we're, we're, we're digging through the complexity of what we're building and the ability to sort of fold through that and, 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 and pour over it and figure out what's important and what's not. We tend to get in naturally so buried and, and deep in what we're building that it's hard to peer out over it and see the important things for what they are. So as we're in these morasses, I urge you to pull yourself out from time to time because it's, it, it, it's, it's a natural thing, or you'll feel it. You know, when you're, when you're doing this, when you're moving into minutia land, you can feel sort of the warping of a fabric because you're pushing too hard, whether it's the specific rounding nest of a button or trying to emulate a na native drop-down. It's sort of warping and pushing too hard, creating, you know, things that may work as such, but an awkward, squishy thing that we've forced into a corner. And these things that feel very delicately balanced, like things that will only work when the wind is blowing the correct way, and then perhaps they come inundating down on us with the slightest bit of shaky shakiness and it just feels sort of tragic instead of what I think we want to build, which is this free or beautiful thing where we have some shaping influence over it artistically, but it's allowed to breathe on its own. In this case, it's tried as it is, sometimes going with the flow can serve you well. Because I believe with thing three that we have to manage risk carefully because every one of these details, every decision we make, and everything we add to the web page or app that we are building introduces risk, and we have to manage that risk. Everything we do, whether it's a web font, a CSS3 transition, a polyfill, a workaround, every little thing we do introduces another detail and another thing that can break. And even when it seems solid, it's complex, and it can be very fragile. Everything we do, every decision we make, 
to add another detail, to add another workaround, to add another JavaScript library can introduce bugs now, or even less fun, introduce bugs in the future as the browsers and user agents evolve beneath us? Are we creating a path to doom by all these details we're introducing? So I urge you to use caution and again, step back, step back, step, step back. That's a theme here. Like reassess consistently. Why are you throwing, or why are you adding this? Why are you adding this? Everything you do makes makes things more complicated. You know, like HTML on its own is responsive. It's all the things we do to it that make it rigid. We don't want to end up with this jungly undergrowth that we can't really understand and that requires a weed whacker to debug, right? You know, I don't want you to inadvertently cage what you're building in, in rigid frameworks. And I have this very unscientific and untested notion these days that when you visit a website on your mobile device, the more it's been mobile optimized, I feel like the more it's likely to break. Because everything that we do to try to constrain and control what's going on creates this light fragility and increases the, the likelihood that the whole thing's going to shatter when there's an assumption we've made that isn't borne out. And then thing four, we, you know, we like to say this to ourselves, right? We've got to keep pushing for standards, la 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 standards, and uh, make it all work. And it's like, okay, so we, we, we tell ourselves we gotta we gotta yammer for what we need. We gotta keep advocating for all the stuff that makes the web tick, right? But sometimes figuring you know, out the questions to ask or the people to ask them too feels like dealing with some sort of very deep cryptography or some sort of code. It's like, how do we even like connect these things together? How who do we talk to and what do we talk to them about? And I also think that we, we empower ourselves or we tell ourselves we should push for all these web standards, but on the flip side, we need to understand what we're asking for. We need to, we need to come and meet halfway in the sense that we need to, to understand the, the way these things tick and how to, how to put them to their best use because if we're asking for the complexity or the import of the moon, we need to know what to do when that's delivered to us on a silver platter. So I think this is one thing where we have to step up a bit as devs, do our reading, Get better, up our game, and understand that the web or understand the kinds of things that the web standards do that we're asking for. Use them and know them, because they are these underlying cogs, the things that bring the web together. I think that um, we have to we have to know what we're building, basically. And then my favorite thing, my list of five things, um, very favorite thing, is the notion of letting go. Um, it, it, I like to use the word onus, but people find that to be an ugly word at times. Um, I like to release the onus a little bit because as devs, or at least, I, I take things really seriously. I, I know that I'm the last sort of line. I'm, I'm on the front line. I'm in the trenches. i got to make things work. So I will, I will torture myself. I will make a white whale out of what I'm building. I will not let go until it works. But it also kills us a little bit. Like, uh, you know, we lose our health. We, we're sort of banded together in this honor, honorable brotherhood trying to make uh, everything work out there. But we also need to understand that there's other people who can have some responsibility and help us make the web tick. It's not all on our shoulders. I don't know how to shift this conversation necessarily easily because it's very wavery in terms of like who's responsible for what, but I do want to want to advocate for us that we aren't responsible for absolutely everything that goes wrong on the web. You know, it's it's that that notion that maybe that we're it's not just us. We're not out there on our own. That there are uh, you know, the oh, taking the browser makers and, and having them be more accountable or any number of things, but we're not we're not entirely the end of the road for, for making things work. So that's my list of five things that I think could move us towards that simpler future. And then because I'm kind of a pessimist, it's like here's a list another list of five things that are hard that are I think kind of hindering um, this movement. And the first thing is dealing with the loss of the adjective mobile when we're talking about building the silence web. Whether that's about describing the web in general or as web developers, formerly maybe mobile web developers, what we're doing out on that web. And it can sound like a game of pride or, or job title tinkering, the notion that we're afraid to let go of that moniker of being a mobile web developer, that we feel that it's a regression to call ourselves web developers because 
my gosh, we've been showing up for the beans. We're specialized in this, right? Like, how do, how do we relinquish that and still communicate that we have this this expertise, like the understanding about the demands and what the new newer future web needs? But I, I, I think that's sort of a shallow look at it because although we, as web developers, mobile web developers, hand device developers, whatever, the notion of mobileness is part of our identity, I think we can move beyond that fairly quickly, get over this minor tragedy and crisis that bloom forth again successfully as web developers. But what I don't want to lose is some of that magical space junk that in our metaphorical garages, developer garages, we've been building to, to conquer this, that the problems faced, uh, that we face at, as mo on the mobile web, I don't want to jettison and throw those out with a wash, but I want to bring back some of the brilliant ones. I don't want to see them rotting and aging out there on the rocks, but instead I want to rescue the ones that are really, really smart. The things that, um, because we are faced with the constraints of mobile nests, we invented, I want to bring those back into the web and help seed the fields of the future web and help it flourish with those ideas. And thing number two on this list of things that are difficult sounds pat, that we can't know the future. Well, duh. But I do think that we overestimate our ability to, to see what's coming at us in the near or mid midterm future. Sure, we can recognize patterns and see trends as they start evolving. And there's some among us who, who are really trend spotters and like really good weather forecasters can look out a little further and see the things on the horizon that are about to come and really get stormy. But we don't know everything and we have to avoid going nobly into the future with too much hubris because that's how we kind of got into sort of this complexity bond in the first place by making too much too many assumptions. You know, it were, well, you got to step back and look at the bigger picture consistently. Step back, step back, reassess, so that we don't get blurry and lose track of what we're doing again and again. And though it's sort of a more specific thing, the third thing on my list is about how the very words and terms we use to describe what we're building, the, the, the hot hardware and software and people involved, I think our, our vocabulary trips us up and can hamper us. I think that... The words that we use to describe what we're building are old and busted. It's not ship shape to help us communicate what we're doing. I mean, you know, take it, instead of illuminating and, and helping clarify things for people around us, it's, it becomes sort of this baffling thing. We take, for example, the word device, this tangled, stupid word that we we use to conflate like 50 notions, whether it's hardware, or software, the implication of platform, or even OS version, all in, all packaged in this one semantic word device. You know, it's like, what do we even mean when we're saying that? And I say this, and I put this problem out to you without any sort of suggesting a solution other than, you know, we start making up nonsense words arbitrarily, and I have to apologize to the Welsh, but, um, you know, it's, it's just tricky, and when I try to come up with things to address it, I just feel like I'm creating something fishy and stinky and artificial, and it just never works out. But man, it's a mess. Can we do... I, I don't know. What are we... Device. Um, and then, coming back to it, even though I hope that we can learn to relinquish some control and sort of push some onus into other parts of the ecosystem, the reality is, as devs, we are on that front line, and damn it, we have to make things work. That's what we do. That's what we get paid for. We have to be creative and flexible and put things to unorthodox and unusual uses. That's what we do, and if we stop doing that, if we stop flexing and adapting, we become frozen and we can't build anything useful at all, and that's what's demanded of us out there. And, and when it, it, it makes it very challenging for us to do these sort of conceptual, abstract, academic shifts toward thinking about different things differently because we gotta, you know, in the end of the day, we gotta get her done. And that's a conflict that I don't want to say that uh, I don't want to ignore. You know, like the, nine times out of ten, if something breaks, it's still my problem, right? Like I gotta go clean that off the floor. And so the the beautiful future I might be talking about that's all simple and elegant just kind of feels a little bit dim and obfuscated in, in on a day to day basis because we're just down there building it, right? And I also feel like we have to address the notion of dumbing down the web. You know, this argument, because I, I do put forward the argument that commonality is, it is a, a king feature on the web that we should share more than we should differentiate, but I don't want to suggest 
that everything should be bland and lowest common denominator, that we should blanket the web with this this vague and simple, boring notion. You know, it, we have to find the right mix between um, commonality and differentiation and reaching towards what's so great about the web and its generalization, but also um, leaving some things in it that are differentiated. Because if we skew too far to the side of sharing everything together, we get this very gray and bland, boring landscape. On the other hand, if we skew too far towards the, again, the thing I've been arguing against the whole time, which is like very device-specific um, workarounds and um, constant differentiation, we get just this chaos of detail so that's all like a bunch of just like lists of wow that's really hard you know so, you know unless this whole thing seem bleak I, I it's weird because I I'm always saying snarky things but at the root of, of my reality I'm actually kind of an optimist and I believe that the reality is that the web will rise to meet us here I mean the it looks a little shattered and, and chaotic right now, but the reality is that, that because the complexity can't scale, the web, I believe, will adapt because this complex stuff that's at the center of the web is sort of self-correcting. The web, I, I, I don't want to use like a metaphor like it's too big to fail, but it is something that's very solid and has been with us for some time. And I think that its very notion of it, that it's too complex right now may actually naturally ease out a bit just because it has to for it to survive. You know, it just like it can swing one way towards vast complexity, I believe that it will come swinging back naturally a little bit towards the center, towards a commonality, towards sanity, as we spread out the responsibility for making it a little bit more simple in the future. So we're looking at this tumultuous thing, and it feels a little bit gaspy. But, you know, like... The more I think about it, and I think about it a lot because I ruminate, it's what I do. So thinking about it, I, I kind of still have this optimism, you know. I believe that it, it, it's going to sort itself out. It's like, oh, 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 here we go. I just can't keep it inside. So, yeah, we're going to make this work. And I, I really do believe that the web is is here to, here to stay, do to do, and that we're going to bring some of the magic that we've figured out on the mobile web into back into folding it into the general web and it's going to be really really great and that's what I've got for you today so thank you in that that was very very abstract presentation I don't imagine that anyone has questions but if you do yes Dan I got a question so did you see did anybody else see any of the videos from um, EdgeComp last week, where uh, some of the technologies behind the web were being kind of debated. Has anybody seen these? Right? One of the things that struck me was that we're talking about revisions uh, to a lot of the core technologies that support things like offline use, right? Kind of key mobile things like offline use and even response design and the, the techniques or the technologies that people use when they're implementing response design. And it really struck me that a lot of the technologies that were being talked about on stage introduce additional complexity, introduce real, you know, and which, which kind of is one of the things that when I read your post and when I am <laughs> you know, just thinking about the theme of your talk, it seems like there's a contradiction going on. You know, we need we need um, more simplicity, which to me is kind of related to the idea of declarative, um, using declarative structures, right? But a lot of the emphasis on the web and, and web development seems to be moving much more towards uh, JavaScript and um, we're moving away from like a declarative, I'm sorry for it's a long winded, but we're moving away from like a declarative, uh, oh, whoops, whoops, no. oh come on, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 you know, things like that, which are declarative, and towards something that's like totally imperative, like, like, uh, can you give me like four things to answer, but, uh, how do we resolve those? <laughs> 
it's really a single thing. It's, it's a philosophical thing. How do we resolve that, that issue, that you know, contradiction? So um, I will admit to taking, in, in, in certain ways, an ostrich sort of head in the sand approach to a few of the things that you're talking about because I feel the same way. For, uh, I think a good example for me is this whole nightmare of responsive images, if you're familiar with that. Like, we've spent two or three years going around and around about, like, how do we deal with the, the images and binary embedded content in this responsive reality? And I have chosen not to become expert at responsive images because I don't believe that any solution that's been proposed is at all kind of feasible. Um, because I see things, when I see things that are like, oh, and then you hack this and you use this bizarre syntax to work around this thing that is kind of works, but there's a race condition, I just back off of that, which isn't a solution at all. But what I'm doing is kind of standing back and waiting because I think that we will fix it. Um, but when... I think, and, and, and then app cache was broken in the first place. But I, I, I just feel, yes, to answer your question, I guess, you know, in the sense of yes, I, I absolutely hear you because it is a contradiction and it's a conflict, right? Like, I cannot say go do this thing. It, it's about making it work in the context you're in. But I do try to take a less is more approach, like, in, in terms of um, making content and apps that work for, for many browsers. I've, stepped back from the idea of polyfilling for lesser browsers in many cases and instead being like, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to toe the line where I can get away with it, you know, the clients and stuff, but um, where I can toe the line of saying, you know, I'm going to enhance this experience um, in a standards compliant way only for the browsers that support it. It, it's, it, it, it becomes a difficult balancing act and that's a really wishy washy answer to your question, but... I have a question for you. Uh, what? Why do you? Why do you feel um, so optimistic about the web? I think I've seen the patterns of its self-correction in the past, and I feel like the really? Brian, you look really skeptical. Just a bit. Maybe I'm blithe. Maybe I'm uh, hopelessly optimistic and naive. Um, what uh, I see it moving really fast, and that that gives me a little bit of hope. Um, why am I optimistic? Wow, I need to go stand in a corner and question myself for a while. Well, no, what I was really asking you: What are the specific signs that you see right now, or is it just the general? Boy, howdy. This is not a question I'm doing well with, apparently. I feel... Maybe it. Maybe it's just that I see that there are so many devices out there that somehow make it work to some extent on the web, whether that's um, on an API level or, 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 or on a full user agent level. And... Maybe I just have hope. I, uh, maybe I just believe in the web, or I like philosophically, I'm sort of married to the web because I like the ideals of it, um, and I want it to work. So maybe I'm just projecting my hopes <laughs> a little bit. Um, but I, I have seen some clarity. I feel like the standards process is moving faster than sometimes it maybe has in the past. Um, at least there's more complexity to it, and there's sort of more things to happening. That doesn't necessarily mean things are being implemented in consistent ways in, in, the, in the real market, but I, I definitely see, I feel like I see things happening. Do you feel the standards are actually keeping pace with the way technology is changing, or merely patching holes from five to ten years You're ago? You're doing that on purpose. I am. You are. Um, I think that app cache is the worst thing that ever happened. <laughs> um, but um, I actually was, I, I'm actually fairly pleased with how, how some of the device APIs are starting to hit the real browsers. Um, I think, you know, we kind of have moved past the idea of where location API was magic. Remember with geolocation, it was like special? It's like, now it's just something we take for granted. Do you think they'll get us where we need to be in five years? It depends on where we need to be in five years. But those are the questions we should be answering now. Yeah, I, I think that 
you know, pushing on it. I, I, I did. I, it is a blind optimism I have. I think that I'm realizing that now. But um, I want it to work so much. You know, it's like, you know, and we shouldn't look. We shouldn't overlook the simple solutions. Yeah, you know, like sometimes we jump forward and try to be like, well, this is easy. That was easy. So therefore, it's not going far enough. You know, it's like local storage works, but everyone hates it because it's too straightforward or whatever. And so we're trying to over complexify it, like user media now, and like. The, Anything else? I was just going to say, maybe like, I don't know what I was just saying, but the number of plugins that you need to just see your website, so you can see on the web, it gradually decreases in case of the live connect, so you don't need to be in the air or quick time, you would just only set flash for your website. Well, I think to a great extent we don't need flash anymore. In fact, I think that we should never use flash ever again, but. <laughs> And that's a good example. I think that HTML5 audio and video look pretty good, like, in comparison. Like, I, th I feel fairly pleased with... Yeah, for draining batteries and making it janky. It's pretty good. Anything else? There was your comment that uh, you would win, uh, we didn't have flash anymore. Would we have video now in HTML5? We wouldn't have, like... Uh, flash before and get to do and then use like fla uh, flash for video. Because for me it's like plugins serve a purpose where it allows us to extend the web uh, and explore new territories and then the standards and the browsers catch up. I think polyfills are like the plugins of the 2010s, right? Because in a, in a way, we instead of having these binary plugins, we're doing things with polyfills to make browsers behave. But they're really limited in what they can actually. Um, embedded into the browser. It, it's, it, in some ways, if it's not actually already largely there, we're not going to actually be able to do much more than the browser can already do today. They Give me an example. Of, well, Flash, actually playing video, um, was actually being able to be done through Flash for years before the browser could do it. You couldn't have done that through JavaScript. No, you couldn't, but I think that we're solving a number of the problems <laughs> that we used to reach for plugins with, with JavaScript now. You couldn't polyfill, uh, say, uh, the audio and video um, stuff. Okay. Okay. Sure. Or the real-time communication stuff. Okay. Yes. Well, just one point: if you, if you want to hear more about WebRTC, there's actually a talk going on right now. Run. By song. <laughs> it's probably more useful song, than what I'm talking song about. From <laughs> Talkbox is going to be around. Uh, so if you want to talk about WebRTC, it's a WebRTC guy. So I, I'm apparently the defender of the web, so I'll be here if you need to like. <laughs> <laughs> I have one more question, which is about responsive design. Um, do you think that there's more that still to me that needs to be done to to evangelize the you know the, the philosophy of responsive the responsiveness? Design? Or are we done? No, actually, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna throw something out there and say no. I think that. We have made responsive web design into this like great way. Hope, <laughs> like, and it is really powerful. But I actually think it's done a really, it's it's been publicized really well, and that we are actually reaching the point where we're in slight danger of over evangelizing it in the sense that we start thinking of it as a pat and reusable solution when it's instead it requires critical thinking. And um, you know, the more we say responsive web design, responsive web design, we stop thinking about it a little bit and. Uh, I actually think that that has been disseminated quite well. I, you know, when I go around to conferences and I talk to, to web devs that you know maybe it, it are coming to the first mobile conference ever, almost all of them not only know what responsive web design is, but know how to implement it. And if you don't, it's really easy to Google. So I, I really feel like that's sort of a. I have this conversation. I mean, just for a slight, a slight counter example, I had this conversation recently with a web developer. And I said, well, about responsive design. And she said to me, oh, yeah, yeah, you and your mobile guys talk about responsive design all the time, right? So, I, so that got me thinking, like, that maybe this isn't as mainstream as I think it is. Maybe we all are in an echo chamber. We are in a rarefied space. The way developers who care about mobile are thinking about responsive design, but, you know. Yeah, and I, I think that we uh, the term responsive gets used wi widely for things that are not responsive either. But then again, like doctrine, like what is responsive and you know, who, who, who owns that term, right? And everyone, go have fun or something. <laughs> Thanks for...